The United States accounts for 5% of the world's population. We account for 25% uh, of the world's inmates. And that represents a huge surge since uh, 1980. A primary driver of this mass incarceration uh, phenomenon is uh, our drug laws, our mandatory minimum sentencing around drug laws. And you know, we have to consider whether this is the smartest way for us to uh, both control crime and uh, rehabilitate individuals. Uh, this is costing taxpayers across America $80 billion a year. And uh, as I said on Tuesday, there are people who need to be in prison. Uh, and uh, I don't have tolerance for uh, violent criminals. Many of them uh, may have made mistakes, but uh, we need to keep our community safe. On the other hand, when we're looking at nonviolent uh, offenders, most of them growing up in uh, environments in which drug traffic is common, uh, where many of their family members may have been involved uh, in the drug trade, uh, we have to reconsider whether 20-year, 30-year life sentences uh, for nonviolent crimes uh, is the best way uh, for us to solve these problems. These are young people who made mistakes that aren't that different than the mistakes I made and the mistakes that a lot of you guys made. Uh, the difference is they did not have the kinds of support structures, the second chances, the resources uh, that would allow them to survive those mistakes. And You know, I think we have a tendency sometimes to uh, almost take for granted or think it's normal that so many young people end up in our criminal justice system. It's not normal. It's not what happens in other countries. What is normal is teenagers doing stupid things. Uh, what is normal is young people uh, making mistakes. And we've got to be able to distinguish between dangerous individuals who need to be incapacitated and incarcerated versus young people who are in an environment in which uh, they are adapting, but if given different opportunities, a different vision of life, uh, could be thriving the way we are.